There's no doubt that aerodynamics have played a huge part in the improved lap times that we've seen here in the cars at World Time Attack. There's a misconception though that developing a proper aero package requires an F1 budget. We're here with Andrew Brilliant from AMB Aero and we'll find out how developing an effective aero package isn't outside the realms of the average club level competitor. So Andrew, this is something that we've seen becoming more and more prominent with uh, World Time Attack cars, as well as motorsport obviously yeah. all around the world. Can we start though by going into your background a little bit, how did you get involved in aerodynamics? Um, I kind of fell into it, I'm not actually trained as an aerodynamicist but uh, as a mechanical engineer and then I was in motorsports and then we started just finding lap time in these little things and I'd always loved fluids and you know, was had a reasonable aptitude with computers. So I just started experimenting and learning a lot and then uh, it became my profession slowly. It turned into a hobby to working with other professionals and then just became full-time uh, business actually. So. so if you want to get into aerodynamics these yeah. days, uh, are there specific courses uh, that people can take uh, at university level yeah. to train or, or do you have to sort of self-train uh, yeah. if you want to look at motorsport aerodynamics? Yeah, no, there's um, so the, there's a couple of, you know, respected aerodynamicists around here that run courses. We, we had one in Australia but we haven't had a venue for it for a little while but um, there's there's a guy named Scott Beaton who has an online one. Um, you can search him out, Air Design, and then also Sammy, Sammy uh, Diasanos. I think I pronounced that right. Um, he's uh, a lecturer at uh, I think University of New South Wales. He's a designer of the Porsche, and that's a they they're both they're both solid guys. And so those seminars are definitely out there. Um, there's plenty of books on the subject, although they're not as in depth as you know the knowledge that's on the high end. They're they're good introductory courses. So as essentially you got into aerodynamics and, and found speed in the cars, obviously you've developed uh, that angle and I think this is something that uh, maybe is overlooked when it comes to getting uh, speed and lap times out of cars, uh, there's, there's a few, right, few areas we can go into, obviously engine performance is, is generally an easy one, uh, there's also working on suspension and mechanical grip from the car yeah. and then of course we've got aerodynamics, obviously if we want uh, the perfect result we, we need all of those working together. Uh, but in terms of like factoring the importance of aerodynamics from your view, how does that sort of rate with uh, the other two areas in terms of uh, what's most beneficial? Like if you had to choose one of those three, uh, what's going to give you the best improvement from your car? Yeah, I mean, that, that'll vary a lot car to car and team to team because how good do they have each of those categories? But they do, they do enhance each other, you know, like the suspension vehicle dynamics is a magnifying lens for the aero. And, you, you can change how the air works so much with the vehicle dynamics. So understanding those interactions is really important. Um, at this level, I mean, as you saw in Time Attack, if you look back in 2009, 2010, nobody was under one minute 30 here. And the basic specifications of the cars have not changed a lot in terms of their, maybe some have gotten lighter, some have gotten heavier because they added air where they didn't used to. Suzuki, for example, is more than 50 kilo heavier than it used to be with air, but much faster. But the, but the whole field's moved into the low 20s from the low 30s. And I think aero is one of, if not the major factor behind that. You know, tires are, have been the same. The, the people have started, actually, they started making more power recently too. Billet engines have made a difference. But I mean, that's not adding up to nine seconds or whatever. I think there's probably a general uh, belief out there in the market that uh, if you want to develop uh, real aerodynamics packages for your cars, you're looking at spending huge amounts of money and this may be off-putting I think. Obviously aerodynamics when we think of it from a, a layman's perspective we're looking at the F1 teams and the sort of budgets these guys have uh, but it, it's possible to to actually uh, achieve a really effective aerodynamic package even at the clubman level, would that be fair financially? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that's the case at all. And I think when we first started doing aero for Time Attack, it had that misconception and people were like, oh, this has all gone too far. And I completely disagree with that because you, compared to what teams spend on engines, I think aerodynamics certainly can be inexpensive. And I, I can give a few concrete examples of that. Um, you know, like the first Time Attack car that I ever did was this uh, NSX in the States that ended up becoming the champion and taking the Sierra, Sierra lap record. And that car, had a aero build budget of I think $350 a sheet alloy in a shed and we ended up going three and a half seconds quicker like that. 
And so, and that was, there was no CFD. It was just like what the team knew and what I knew and a fabricator didn't sleep very much. And that's what we came up with. So you have to, I think you first have to wipe it out of your head that there, there are shapes that have to be perfect. Like a wing is a really fine tuned shape. And then there's some things that are like taking a sledgehammer to the car and making a really big impact just because people don't understand how it works and bringing that knowledge level up and t training the teams about how to use that arrow will make a big difference as well. So I think um, another example would be like Nick Ashwin or Under Suzuki or even Andy Forrest where they've built their own arrow. So they've taken so much of the cost, like the raw material cost is not that much and the design cost is not that much. It's, it's getting it built that's expensive. And if you, if you take on that attitude, you know, I think composites are new to this group. Fab everyone's been fabricating for a long time. Like Andy Forrest and their team, they got on YouTube and they got videos about how to make carbon fiber. I got a long list of teams that learned how to make their bodies on YouTube. And that's... So I think the, the point here is AMB Aero, uh, you, you offer a consultation service, so it's not a full house, well it doesn't have to be a full house service where yeah. a team drop off a car, uh, come back, write out a massive check and pick up the car, finish with a full Aero uh, package attached. You can work in a multiple different ways including just providing some consultation, uh, telling the teams what they need to do and then allowing the teams to actually uh, implement those changes themselves and that can be quite a cost effective option. Yeah, I mean, we have an entry level package designed for those teams. That that was the point of what we wanted, what I wanted to do when I founded this business with my partner, was that we wanted to grass level people to be able to do aero, and for it not to be this thing where they built a bunch of stuff that didn't do anything, but to give them proper aero build of some kind. And we wanted to do that for every budget. So we start at you know two thousand dollars. We have packages for two thousand dollars. Um, there's another. There's a customer that had that made a video. It's out there on the internet as well. And if you search about that, you can find a lot of stuff. But then we've also got mid-range stuff. You know, seventy, five hundred, fifteen thousand dollars. And if you want to be in the like under Suzuki MCA, Andy Forest level of stuff, yes, that's a significant design cost. But it still pales in comparison to the production. I think straight away those numbers you're talking about starting at 2,000 US dollars for some consultation is probably a, a lot cheaper than uh, most people are thinking. I mean that probably is uh, comparable to what a team is spending on a, a set of tyres uh, and, and you're getting a real world uh, advantage from aero, uh, an aero package that then they can go and implement themselves. Now let's talk a little bit about your actual design process when uh, you're faced with a fresh car, one that you haven't worked with before. Uh, so what's the first step if you've got a team that has a reasonable budget and uh, they want you to develop something that's actually going to be really effective at maybe the pointy end of the, the pro class here at World Time Attack. Yeah, I, so I think the fundamental principle of the design will all be catered around the team. Um, firstly, who's building it, who's driving it, who's managing the program, and it's quite custom to each of those factors. Like we could do two of the same platform in a row and the car will be very different because we think very much about what's realistic for this team to build. And if we go and design something that an F1 team can manufacture and it's some guy in a shed with his mates, that's not gonna happen. So you have to be, I think, really diligent about catering it that way. Um, and that's why you see such a big diversity of our packages, like you'll see us go from Nemo to Scorch and there's, there's so different, you know, one, anyway, that, that you basically really customize it to, to those factors. And we can even tune the arrow to be more or less sensitive, so it's got more peak downforce but harder to drive because a pro might be able to do that but an amateur cannot. And we have so many things we think about that way. Uh, in terms of dealing with developing that package and giving the team uh, a model to work with or the shapes to work with and sizes etc, uh, you're starting by actually digitizing the car, correct? Yeah, yeah, so it, with uh, you know, the entry level package is more just what we call best practices where we look at the car and we help them figure out how to make sure it cools and works better dynamically. And then from the mid-level package on up, which we call our, pro, our Time Attack Pro Racer package, um, well obviously we have packages outside of Time Attack. But um, so those are where we start scanning the car. I mean, so usually I'll fly in myself because I want to spend time with the team and teach them about aero. And at the same time we do that, we 3D scan the car and then take that back to the office where we process that and turn it into the 3D model that we use for CFD or, or wind tunnel or whichever thing they're going to do. 
So talk to us a little bit about CFD because that's something that's obviously uh, become more prominent as computing power has increased, uh, obviously uh, reduced the, the cost and development time of Aero. So how does that process work? Yeah, that's actually, I mean, I know I might be going off topic a little bit, but that's been so fascinating to watch because the way compute power has changed over the last 10 years is what's made that now accessible. So that's really changed the landscape of CFD now because now these small companies can spring up that are able to do this high-end development that used to be totally impossible because you had to have a you know, data center size supercomputer to do any, to even dream of it. And so, um, so that's, that's what's possible now. And, We've become half an IT company in a way because we're just constantly building machines and you know maintaining them. And um, but CFD is very powerful. It has its weaknesses, but it has its strengths. That the cost is there, and you can if you can dream up a shape, you can draw it and you can test it. You don't have to physically build this thing in real life like you do in a wind tunnel. So massively reducing the development cost because when you finally uh, go through the process of making a physical part you can be pretty confident from uh, the CFD results that that part is going to uh, give you the results you're expecting? Oh yeah and, and the, the quantity of tests you can do. So I mean there's some things that are fast to do in a wind tunnel like adjusting a wing angle for example you know CFD that's another run but if we could test so many parts in a week in CFD that you could never dream to do in a wind tunnel just stuff that's out, you think of something out there and you learn from it and that that's still impossible in a wind tunnel without a team of you know 50 model builders and you know, it's, it, it'd get out of control. If you tried to match I think how many crazy things we can test in a day, you'd need a hell of a model team in a wind tunnel. In terms of validating the results that you're getting from CFD, uh, when you do have the opportunity to work with a team that has a budget for wind tunnel testing, uh, I mean typically how, how well do the results from the CFD analysis line up with real world downforce results? Um, I would say that our CFD is lining up probably with one exception that we're still getting to the bottom of, but with the exception of that one car, historically we've been closer than the wind tunnels were to reality so far most wind tunnels now there are very good wind tunnels out there you know twenty thousand dollar a day wind tunnels but there's a lot of wind tunnels that are so so but the those things are actually not important and we don't worry so much about that unless we find a hole in what that wind tunnel sees we look at relative accuracy not absolute accuracy absolute figures i believe should only be derived from a measurement on the real car we look at a cfd gain value and we've learned to trust that and there are some things that we've learned about CFD we know yeah that's kind of the boundary of CFD but the wind tunnel is the same way there are certain things the wind tunnel will tell you wrong and there are times when they'll contradict each other even and having that depth of knowledge that experience you can just stay away from that kind of a design and that doesn't mean that you're giving up something because you just spend your time developing around things you know are, are, are accurate and you yeah I want to delve a little bit further into the wind tunnel, but uh, first of all, uh, if you aren't using the wind tunnel to validate your designs, uh, how do you validate those in the real world? How are you getting uh, the results off the car at a racetrack? Yeah, well we do we do, do wind tunnel validation um, if the customer budget allows, but most time attack teams, we've only had a few exceptions to this, did not have the budget for CFD to wind tunnel to, to on track. And we were the first to do all three together, but um, that's quite rare. So we do rely a little bit on the data we've gathered from one car that's managed to do that sort of a correlation project. And we have to sort of apply it everywhere because the budget just doesn't allow for that. Um, but we do push really hard for all of our teams to instrument the car at least in some way so that we can validate the data. So we're talking here load cells uh, in, the, in, the sh in the suspension system? Yeah, load cells, shock pods, ride height sensors. And there's, there's ways like, I mean, there are really primitive ways that you can do this if you've really not got a budget. I mean, when I started out racing my own car and Bonneville stuff, you know, we'd go out on the dry lake and we stuck zip ties on the shock shaft and did a coast down test and we could, you know, it's, it's rough, it's rough data, but data is data and you, we were able to make a car that was unstable, stable that way. So that's a win. And so there's, you, I don't think, I would never tell a team to not test because you don't have the ultimate way to test. You've got to validate any way you can afford to do. But it's not really that expensive in the picture of building a car to put four shock pots on it. But the, the really important thing is the process. I've 
cannot stress enough how difficult it is to do that process properly. Even if you have the sensors, we get customers come back with data and they're like, oh, the downforce isn't there. And then um, this happened really recently with a customer and we just force them to put it on the scales and then load up the car incrementally and then see what the actual curve laid out as. And it was drastically different. It actually lined right up to CFD where for a year they thought they were missing downforce. So essentially if you don't know how to analyze the data that you've got, then you're just guessing. So, so that's a that's a big part of what we try to do is to get teams to measure as good as we can. Um, it's ideal when you can sit, you know, sit with them through the testing, but that's not always realistic. So you try to train them and we give documentation to them about how to do that the best they can. Okay, let's just move back to the wind tunnel testing because obviously that's a, another area where uh, we've grown up seeing that being sort of related to F1, uh, that sort of level. Uh, but uh, you were talking to me earlier about uh, model uh, sort of part scale testing uh, that can be affordable for the teams who are at the pointy end of a semi professional motorsport such as World Time Attack. Can you talk us through how, how that works? Yeah, so there's a technology that we kind of I hope, I hope we pioneered it. I don't know if anyone, I don't know who else is doing this, but we, I mean, Suzuka, uh, my, my partner slash mentor, was had this idea that most of motorsport was using too big of a scale for what they were doing, and I think that this was all based on what markets they're selling to. Like, if you've got a, okay, 50% scale wind tunnel, that's or 60%, let's say, that's a standard kind of scale wind tunnel. Well, just to step back there, so for those who aren't aware, what we're talking here is a, a scale of the size of the car. So a one-to-one, -one, obviously, we're taking the actual car running in the wind tunnel, but that gets very costly. The wind tunnel needs to move a huge amount of air, hence the wind tunnel becomes more expensive. So it becomes cheaper if you're using uh, a scaled-down tunnel with a scale model of the car. So that's what we're talking about. Yeah, exactly. And the, the, it's the cost of building the models and the parts to test. We, you talk about, if you went to a full-scale wind tunnel, one-to-one, -one, you have to physically build in full scale every single part you're going to test. How many parts can you test in a day? That's really hard and you have to plan out ahead to build all the parts you're going to test. You can't be guided by testing. You can't get feedback from the testing and so um, that becomes very, very difficult to do. Now if you move to smaller scales you start getting new technologies coming in such as 3D printing. You can 3D print parts or um, they take less time to, to construct for various means. They don't have to be as rigid because they're taking less load in the smaller scale. So it, 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 the cost of wind tunnel goes up at the cube of the scale. So it's, it's really a high, you know, it gets really nasty at the high end of it. And when it comes to that uh, small scale testing though, the accuracy of the model becomes more and more uh, important. You were talking to me earlier, one of the issues, or uh, one of the important issues with uh, Aero is the ride height. And of course when you scale down the model, uh, those ride height changes become more and more precise. So can you tell us how that works? Yeah, I mean, all, all every single dimension of the thing becomes more and more high precision as you get to the smaller scale. So that part's difficult. And that is part of what you accept as your plus minus, allowable plus minus, and how true you think this model shape is to the real car. Well, you know, we integrate 3D scanning back in, so we have like a smaller scale, really high accuracy scanner. We scan the models back in, so we get a better feel for how far off these things are, but you still, you still struggle with those kind of things at small scale. So you, it's, you know what the problems are, what the shortcomings and the difficulties are, and then you use it for what it's good at. And when it's not good anymore, you move on to the next thing. And that is a much more efficient process if you do it that way. Now you mentioned that uh, some of the, the large one-to-one -one scale professional wind tunnels, you're sort of talking uh, $20,000 a day or more. Uh, if we're looking at some of these cheaper scale wind tunnels, uh, can you give some indication of, of what a day testing on that wind tunnel might look like? Oh, you mean like cost-wise? Oh, there's a there's a bunch of, like, I don't know in Australia, but I know like in North Carolina, they have some of these ones like the NASCAR guys use, and they're really inexpensive, you know. You, you could go there for like two or four grand, but there no, there's no moving belt in them. So there are some things you can trust and some things you can't when you don't have a new moving belt. And if your team is looking at trying to make this, figure out the cooling system or the rear wing, you know, you might you might get you might make major improvements in a tunnel like that. So you never rule it out and say, oh, that testing's bad testing, forget it. But you gotta know what it's good at. 
Okay, I want to move on and talk a little bit about the aero balance of the car. So, I mean, again, from a layman's perspective, it seems like it would be a relatively easy task to go and put a big wing on the back of a car and make a ton of downforce at the rear of the car. Uh, but, of course, that's going to affect the balance of the car because we've only looked at the rear. So, uh, obviously, in order to make the car uh, work correctly, it's important to balance the downforce from the front to the rear. Uh, so, how do you go about doing that and, uh, obviously, CFD, you've got some ideas there, uh, what can you do to allow that to be adjusted in the real world to suit the car and the driver? Yeah, I mean there's so many strategies for how you do this and it, we cater it a lot to the car and the team but the basic concept in Time Attack is we give them an adjustable rear wing and then we have a CFD value that we've found uh, that most drivers are happy with and we sort of float around that percentage and it's based around the weight distribution of the car so there's a there's a percentage variance from that which is a driver preference or a team preference or there's a lot of complex factors going on like how the car is actually changing its attitude dynamically like what it's doing in yaw roll pitch and there's so much complexity to that we're learning we learn every day about this today especially we're still learning right and and that's the point why we come out here is to um, try to find out those kind of things but we get that percentage smaller and smaller every time so and the tighter we're able to make that adjustment window as we learn more then the more we size the wing appropriately and then they end up being more efficient that's one of the ways we can make the the wing drag less because we don't have to make it able to have an extra 20 percent rear we go no no this is fine-tuned right for this number Okay, the other thing we see with the high downforce cars is it has, uh, adds a complexity to the suspension design because yeah. uh, you've got a car that uh, has obviously zero downforce when it's sitting stationary. As the speed increases, the downforce also increases, which tends to compress uh, the suspension. So particularly when we're getting cars here that are, are getting sort of 280 kilometres an hour at the end of the front straight going to turn one, uh, this compresses the suspension down. So uh, how, how are the teams best to deal with this? Uh, do we run uh, higher spring rates and compromise the uh, the suspension system uh, run on the bump rubbers or third spring and damper setups what's your preference well I to me I mean obviously a third spring is is a, a much better situation because you're having a you have a heave heave control system and that's really what you what you'd want I'm short of an active suspension or something like what Andy Scott Andy Forrest has got where he's got an actual you know he's affecting the length of the push rod dynamically um, on the third, I don't know. Maybe you yeah. No, we we looked at uh, Andy's car. He's got a little ear canister. I don't believe that he's actually using it yet, but uh, yeah, ultimately it will be able to yeah, yeah change the ride height uh, at at speed essentially. But uh, yeah, in, in most instances, um, the the third spring or the heave spring is is the best arrangement. If we don't have that, what's your your second best? Uh, the second best is going to be you're going to have to use some combination of bump stop and spring, right? Because what you've got is a, if you if you make the car rigid enough to endure turn one without using any bump stop whatsoever, then to with the kind of air loads we've got now, you're going to wind up with this spring rate that's way more than the tire spring rate, which means that all the energy being fed into this car around the racetrack is going into the tire. And you see the teams now um, are working on trying, some of the teams that have more downforce are working on trying to ride this limit of, of, of tire burst failure. And either one of those things will contribute to it because they both feed, feed energy into this tire and um, cause it to overheat or to, to damage the sidewall and come apart. So with the third spring setup like Andy's, that's just letting you control that so you're able to make a car that's softer for a greater percentage of the lap and the time when the car is really rigid is less. And that's, um, and that's the basic concept. And bump stops, you can do that, but not as well, um, because inherently, let's say you tuned it, you said, okay, I want to use the bump stops only on the straightaway. Then you can, you have to have a ramp rate. Like you can't make it just instantly go to one or the other. The car is difficult to handle. So, you know, like at high end of motorsport, you'll sit in a room full of engineers, and this is all you do all day is looking at an air map and looking at the suspension and going how do we get more air out of this car and not blow up tires and not make it difficult to handle and that's how aero, how prioritized aero is at the top level but and this is becoming that way so there's no there's no solid answer about this it's going to be 
you've got to get somebody good that knows what they're doing with that stuff and they're going to be constantly tweaking that and changing it track to track. That so essentially, long story short there, we're, we're always going to be focusing on a compromise if you want to get that, that aero and make the suspension and the aero uh, work together. Yeah, yeah, and then you got to have good aero data too. Like if you, if you have no idea what the aero is doing, what are you doing with the suspension? So it's, um, it's important to, to make that work as a package. That's what the top end of the field will be doing moving forward, and you see that. You see that happening now. Another common uh, myth, I don't know if it's a myth, I yeah. wanted to get some answers on this, another common thing I hear is that uh, aero doesn't really produce any downforce until the car's perhaps uh, up around 100 mile an hour, sort of 160 kilometres an hour. Is there truth in that? Obviously the aero downforce does increase with speed, yeah. uh, but what sort of speeds can we start getting really useful increases in downforce? That depends on how much downforce you've got. right? If you've got a car that's got mega, mega downforce at in the slowest corner on this track, so like our highest downforce track out here today, in the slowest corner here, has twice as much downforce as a GT car does in a high speed corner. You're gonna feel that, right? And, it, and if you look at the trend, people have that misconception and the evidence I would give to disagree with that is, if you look at the top end, autocross, hill climb, all those cars, massive, massive aero. And it's really important for them. So yes, the speed's lower, but then they put low speed aero on it and it's just as important as anywhere else. And if you look at even really tight courses, you look at like Formula SAE, those are the tightest courses there are. Super low power, super tight courses, mega aero. And it, it's a percentage of the lap time. For them, if they gain two, three tenths on aero, it's the same thing as gaining a second and a half here because the course is only 30 seconds long. So essentially the speed, uh, you, you're just designing the package to suit the speeds that the car's going to be seeing. Yeah, it just changes your drag curve. And we look at that in simulation. You know, as we as we go through our, our test runs and we look at it in our in our database and then we see how much drag we're picking up and we run simulations on the change in downforce and the change in drag and we make sure that we're always on the right side of that curve and sometimes we try to be a little low drag more than the computer predicts um, that we think that's the right way but um, you have to calculate this kind of things. Well, look, Andrew, thank you for the insight there. I, I think hopefully that's uh, dispelled some of those myths that uh, proper aero is only in the league of those with uh, million dollar budgets. And uh, if people do want to find out more about you, maybe work with you, how can they get in touch? Uh, yeah, you can just go onto our website. It's, it's amb-aero.com. Yep. All right, thanks for the chat, Andrew. Yeah, no problem. If you like that video, make sure you give it a thumbs up and if you're not already a subscriber, make sure you're subscribed. We release a new video every week. And if you like free stuff, we've got a great deal for you. Click the link in the description to claim your free spot to our next live lesson. You'll learn about performance engine building and EFI tuning and you'll also have the chance to ask questions which I'll be answering live. Remember it's 100% free, so follow the link to claim your spot.